So today we've got a fun treat for you. It's a, uh, it's a cool design that actually my assistant John came up with and he showed it to me one day and gave me this um, you know, general sketch view that isn't perfect. It was just what he was able to draw. And I was like, yeah, let's, let's try that. I don't even know if it's gonna work. We don't even know if it's gonna look good. But I think going through the process of deciding uh, what the wood can and can't do and how sturdy this thing is when it's all said and done is gonna be pretty cool. Obviously what we're looking at here is a C table is what a lot of people call them uh, that allows you to kind of nest it right up against the couch and it goes over the arm. But obviously, you're gonna put stuff on this so stability is a concern. Uh, but what the wood does when it bends in, in that fan shape, well, we don't really know. So we took this uh, starting image and then tried to translate that to paper so that we can get a real life in the shop starting point. And let me show you where we're at. So the first thing we did was we got our overall dimensions. That's just based on John's couch, uh, making sure that this thing would fit. So we've got about 16 inches to play with here. And what's gonna happen is those pieces will join to our bottom, they'll come up and fan out, and we just needed to decide what pattern we wanted up here. And we're going with even spacing. So what looks good to our eye is a nice 7 8 gap at the top, and at the bottom, those pieces, the strips, will be separated by a quarter inch filler piece. Um, now, one of the big questions is how thick should these pieces be? What kind of bend can this stuff take? And when you go over, it's a 24 inch tall piece, so what kind of bend will it take over that 24 inches? We don't really know. I just know that a quarter inch is probably gonna be too thick. You know, something like this isn't really gonna bend very well. Uh, if you go down to something like an eighth, that'll certainly bend well, but maybe that's just a little bit too flimsy. So we're gonna start with 3 16 and that's not exactly what this is, but it's close. Uh, we're gonna go 3 16 and just run some tests and see if we can get this thing to bend the way that we want it to bend. Now our first step is to cut those strips, right? So to, to get them perfectly sized, we need to know what they're gonna go into. So what we're gonna try here is at the table saw, we're gonna make 3 16 grooves, and I'm gonna use that as a test for our strips to go into to make sure we have the right size. So check out what I have here. So to get our 3 16 I actually have our eighth inch outer blade and a 16th inch chipper. I've never really done a cut like this. Normally you have a sandwich of the two outside pieces, the outside blades, but uh, I think we'll be able to make this cut safely. So I'm gonna do this in a piece of scrap just to test it out. If anything feels weird, we'll find a different way to do it. I've got some oddball pieces of sapili left over from my big green egg table build. I think we can use those to make the strips for this project. I use the bandsaw to cut some that are just over 3 16 of an inch. That'll be the long pieces, and then some at a quarter inch for the short pieces. This is one of those times that I'm really glad to have a drum sander as I sneak up on the perfect thickness. So now that we have a bunch of strips cut, we're gonna take a piece of scrap material, and I've got some center lines here, which is our approximate spacing that we're gonna need. I just wanna see if this is gonna work, so we'll have to just do this with some test pieces. So I'll just make a few of these cuts here. And actually, I already have a zero clearance um, you know, location for the blade, so I can just kinda of eyeball these pencil lines, center them, and we should be good. All right, so while John is holding that piece down, I'm taking our 3 16 pieces and tapping them into their slots. Get all these in place. Okay, so now we just need a mark that tells us where to put our quarter inch pieces so we can sandwich these guys together. And for us, that's gonna be about 18 inches from what would be the underside of our top. So if I can just go in the middle, place a pencil mark here. Okay, none of these are perfect, but it's close enough. So now we just need to add this clamping pressure here. Not that it needs it, but just in case. 
Now, I'm really glad that we did this because we just sat here for about 15 minutes talking about the results of this test. The first thing you might notice is how sturdy this is. This is almost behaving like a solid panel. I mean, there's certainly a little bit of flex, but the big question I had was, could this thing be sturdy enough to do its job? And this is only one of these. We're gonna have two holding our top in place. So I actually am extremely confident that this is going to be strong enough. There's just not much opportunity for movement the way these pieces are clamped together. So that's pretty cool. The other thing is trying to figure out an assembly strategy here. So we are actually going to be able to use this piece that we've already cut to do sort of a pre-sub assembly and then use that to transfer this piece without these guys moving out of position into the final top, right? And I think that's a really good way. You'll see later we'll have opportunities to surface this material because the bottom also has to be joined into the base. Uh, the other thing we noticed was up here at the top, just because the pieces were scrap wood, we had some that had angles cut on them, little miters. And then we looked at that and said, you know what? That actually looks pretty cool. So we're gonna incorporate those miters into this final design. So this test run was definitely a big success. Uh, I think at this point we, well, we could probably actually start gluing some of these together, but notice we've got a lot of different colors in here. We're gonna color match them so that it looks good. So fortunately we cut a lot of extras and we have enough that we can color match. So you can see all of these are pretty much the same color and the quarter inch spacer is also the same color. Uh, the danger you run is if you have lighter pieces like this and you start to get a stripey look, uh, if that's what you have to do and that's what you wanna go for, go for it. The thing is, you know, kind of would look a little bit goofy if it was just interspersed throughout there. So I'm gonna take all the light ones and put those on the side for another project uh, and we'll go with all these dark ones. So first thing we need to do, we're gonna cut a nice square edge on all of our thinner pieces, the ones that fan out, and then the thicker pieces at the bottom, we're gonna put those little miters on the ends so that we have that decorative touch. All right, so we're gonna throw some wax paper down here because I want to not only squeeze these together but apply pressure down so they're nice and even all the way across. So this will stop them from being glued to the table. All right, so we're gonna put these guys in place first. Now, for the sake of expedience, we're just gonna add glue on the spacer pieces. We'll keep the glue away from the top there. Mm -hmm. Let you have the honors. It looks right, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Skips one in between. All right, so my hope is that these are going to stay right where I put them as we start to apply clamping pressure. So we let this guy dry overnight. I think when you have something that's under tension like that, you really do wanna give the glue a nice amount of time to cure so that you can be sure it isn't gonna split apart. Now the next thing we need to do is flatten this guy out and I wanna keep this thing in place. I think it's a good idea. It's gonna help us when we do our actual glue up later. And thankfully, because it's thinner than the height of this material, I can actually just send this through the drum sander or planer to get it nice and clean uh, and then flip it over and do the other side. Uh, before we do that though, I wanna make sure that all of these pieces are as far down, sort of flush with that bottom as possible. All right, that looks pretty good. Let's head to the drum sander. Now to trim this the length, we've measured down from the top, struck a line, and we're gonna make this cut. As you can see, it's kind of a weird cut because this, uh, you know, this bow here prevents us from registering properly at the saw, but if I use a block for support, then I can kind of line up against that, then line up with my laser, 
keep my hands at a safe distance and we should be all right. All right, so for the top, we're gonna use white oak and it's gonna be out of four quarter stock. Um, we're gonna need to put a couple pieces together to get the width that we need. It's about 16 inches. So we've got a nice panel glue up to do here. We also have one for the bottom, but right now I'm really just focused on the top because we wanna make sure all this joinery stuff is gonna work out. So let's make a panel. The panel is pretty straightforward, but the dimensions are a little bit weird. Because of how we want to run the joinery, the panel will be extra wide. The base will be made from eight quarter stock and it'll be roughly the same length and width. What's nice about this white oak is that it's really heavy and dense and it should provide lots of counterweight to keep the top from tipping. Once the glue is dry, the top panel is cut to final size. All right, so now we have our top and we've got to find an accurate way to transfer the notch locations from our little fan structure here to the top itself. So we know we want the first one to start about three quarters of an inch in. So I've got a square set for three quarters and I'm just gonna line up the actual workpiece here. Okay, once I'm confident where that is, I'm gonna hold down and actually just mark pencil lines on either side of each piece. And while we have this here, we can actually do the other side as well. So now we'll measure in three quarters and mark. Okay, and there's all of our marks that we could use now at the table saw. Now we're gonna use the same setup to make the notches that we used before in our test piece and our, our little glue up jig that we made. Um, but what I've done is extended my lines on that workpiece a little bit higher so they go above my fence. And I've also extended the lines on the fence itself for the kerf of the blade and put them on the top. So now from the back side as the user, I could very easily see when we're lined up and I can make each cut. All right, so we are trying to get this thing ready for assembly and we managed to rotate this holding jig 90 degrees to give us room to play with these fingers and to hopefully get them aligned. Now, because we, we didn't really cut these systematically, we just kind of drew with pencil line, uh, that's of course going to be prone to error and that's what we're finding here. So trying to get these guys to line up perfectly is not really panning out and I'm afraid we're gonna start crushing these fibers so as much as I wanted to do this, unless we use like a box joint jig to start cutting these things at perfect even intervals, I think we're stuck trying to, to manage getting this thing together the hard way, which means as, as much as I don't feel like it's a great idea, we're gonna take this guy out of our little holding jig and see if we can't get that into our actual workpiece. Now one thing I know we're going to want to do is chamfer the leading edge of each one of these pieces so that as we press it down into place, we got a little bit of a head start to allow this to find home. As long as we don't go too deep with this, we could have these protrude from the final assembly and sand them flush so you'll never know that was there. All right, so here goes nothing. Thankfully we have two people. 
I'm going to just get each one of these started and see if we can't actually get this thing to go. They're all seated. Okay. So those are all in, and I think they're in far enough that if we had glue, we could sink those home. Um, I think we should stop right now, though, because unless we're ready to glue it up, I think we, uh, we don't want to do any more denting or damaging anything. So um, that, I think, is a proof of concept that we can successfully get these together. So we've made up another one of these guys. We now have two, and it's time to attach them to our top. This could get a little bit hairy. Uh, we thankfully have two, two sets of hands, and I think you really need that uh, to get this done. Another thing I'm gonna do is use epoxy here. We want a little bit more working time. We also want a glue that is not water-based. Water-based is gonna swell these fingers, make it even harder for us to get them in place. So epoxy plus two sets of hands, and I think we might be able to get this thing to work, I hope. So while this epoxy dries, now is a great time for us to work on the base. We're going to use eight quarter oak for that, uh, white oak, and that's a pretty heavy species and the extra thickness is going to be really useful here because we have something that's kind of, you know, the way this table is shaped, the heft of the base is going to keep this thing stable, right? So we're going as thick as the couch will allow us to go um, using some eight quarter stock. So now with the base together, we can put our pencil marks in place here, uh, the theoretical marks, because it might have moved, right? It might not be in the same position. So we've got our pencil lines, and they actually do match up pretty well. But this would be the time that if we saw something weird where one of these pieces was a little bit over, we would make those adjustments in our pencil marks. But I think we're pretty good. So now we can go to the table saw and start to hog out this material. Alright, so with a little bit of back and forth, we've got both of these guys dropping into place, and that's about as good as we can do right now. We can't really fully assemble this until this epoxy dries, so that is good enough for now. Alright, so it's been a few days, the uh, glue has dried, and I think we just want to take an extra precaution by putting a dowel into this top part of the joint. There's a lot of pressure there, and if there's any part of this table that's going to fail, it's likely here at this joint. So we're just gonna drill in maybe about an inch from each side and then pop in a quarter inch dowel. It's gonna be oak, so it's gonna actually match this sort of uh, color combination that we have here. And I think that's actually gonna add quite a bit of reinforcement that'll make this a little bit stronger over time. So we'll give it a shot. Now the only way I think we can get this to work is if we actually bend these to get the insides done. So we're just gonna be very careful about it, not bend it any further than we have to. Get a little glue in there. Now we have this started on both sides because it's so you know, prone to movement here. We're gonna try to sink these with a clamp.
Now, while those dowels dry, we've got a lot of cleanup to do. We've got to flush this surface up, add some roundovers, just kind of get this thing ready for finish. Uh, so we could do all that now while the glue is drying. Now this part of the table side is gonna be joined to the base and it's just gonna be glue and screws. So we're gonna drill and countersink. All right, so now we need to locate these guys in the right place so that we can continue drilling into the white oak. So we're just going to seat these completely. Okay, right there. So this was a super fun kind of experiment in collaboration, taking John's original idea and seeing what we can do with it and bringing it to life. Uh, the end result is delicate, tasteful, but also sturdy, surprisingly sturdy, because that's actually the first thing people ask me when they see this is how well does it work? Uh, well, for the intended purpose of like putting a drink up here or a snack or something like that, it's perfectly fine. Do you want to sit on this? Absolutely not, but check it out it's actually a lot sturdier than you might think. These uh, you know, fingers being held in tension the way that they are actually makes it quite sturdy. Now, its weak point is right here. If you put a lot of pressure right here, you will probably snap those fingers. But you could still put quite a bit of pressure. The wood flexes a little bit, but again, for its intended purpose, it's gonna be perfectly fine. Now, the cool thing is I had an opportunity to riff on this design just a little bit more. Uh, Powermatic came out to my shop. They asked me to build a project. Thought this was a good candidate because it uses a lot of the Powermatic tools. And it afforded me the opportunity to play with the design a little bit more and see if we could take it just a bit further. Um, there were some surprises, though. Let me show you what we came up with. Now, check out this version. On this one, we had to raise it a little bit because it's for a slightly taller couch. Uh, I've got some under bevels on the top, some bevels on the bottom that just kind of add a little bit more dimension. And the big change comes from the way that we orient the fingers for the fans. Let me turn it around. Instead of having 90 degree cuts along our top here, I decided to fan them out to make one continuous curve in the fans. So at the middle, we go with zero degrees, then we move to five degrees, 10 degrees, and 15 degrees. And that just allows for the fans to be one continuous curve instead of sort of a compound curve on the original where we go out and then come back in so that these pieces go straight and perpendicular into the top. Not necessarily better, just different. And down at the base where the laminations come together, you could see I've just kind of created a little bit of a smooth curve between these pieces instead of the somewhat zigzagged design that we included in the original. And of course, I had to score some woodworker bonus points by using some really nice material for the top. This is just a book-matched crotch walnut. It kind of looks a little bit like, I don't know, maybe a chest x-ray? Maybe that's a bad thing, I don't know, but I think it looks pretty cool. Uh, and down at the bottom, where the base is, I was able to kind of create a bit of a book match. It's not a true book match, but these pieces were cut from the same board and then oriented so that the grain kind of looks like a mirror image. Just a nice little detail. 
So when we compare these two, it's actually really interesting. Uh, John was the one who noticed that the original version is actually a little bit sturdier. It doesn't have as much spring to it. This guy, you can move a little bit more easily. Now both are sturdy, both will do what they're intended to do, but this one definitely has a little bit more springiness to it. So as we thought about the design, we're pretty sure that it comes down to this compound curve here. These fingers are, are sort of going outward this way, and then they have to come back in to make that perpendicular cut into the top. So having them sort of tensioned that way seems to make it just a little bit more stiff. On this one, we just have a single bend in each piece, and you just have a little bit more springiness. Again, neither one is problematic, but it's just something to be aware of if you're gonna try one or the other. Uh, now, both of these were successful builds. We did have one that was not a successful build, and I could show you the results from that and why it happened. While I was filming with Powermatic, I was doing the assembly process, and I noticed some of these fingers were getting a little bit too snug. Uh, but being under pressure, there's glue in the joints, you know, I had no choice, I just had to keep pounding through. And what that did was it kind of served as a wedge. And a wedge with grain oriented this way is bad news, right? That actually just caused a split right along the grain, and boom, now we have two smaller tables. Now the moral to the story there is number one, don't rush. Number two, make sure that these fingers are thin enough that they fairly easily slide in and out of these slots. If there's too much tension and if they are too wide, they will actually serve as a wedge and split along the grain. Now you might be tempted to say, well, let's run the grain the other way. Now you can do that, but if you run the grain this way, all these little slots line up perfectly with each other, and that actually kind of creates something of, think of it like a fault line, that is also a weak point. And the way this table is used, pressure will be applied here. So that weak point seems to be something that will bite you in the butt later if you put a little bit too much weight there, it could snap right along that grain line. So uh, I could see an argument for running the grain of this top either way, but I think the best way, the strongest way is to do it as we've done here. You just gotta make sure that these fingers aren't a snug fit when it's dry, because if it's a snug fit when it's dry, it's gonna cause problems when you're doing the assembly and you have glue on there. So that was a lesson learned. Uh, this one, I'm not sure what we're gonna do with that. Maybe we'll make a shorter one, uh, but certainly this one, this one could just be a single, you know, maybe just for a single coffee cup, uh, but we'll do something to salvage this one. Now at the risk of sounding a little bit too philosophical, I wanted to take a minute to talk about design evolution. Um, because for me, you know, I don't really create designs out of thin air. I build upon the greatness of other people. I take influence from everything that I see and try to take it to a different level. This is a great example. John had a drawing, we decided to build it, and then I saw a few opportunities to change things just a little bit to see if I can make it a little more interesting or a little more to my personal taste. And I think that's perfectly okay. In the world of woodworking and furniture making, I think a lot of people feel like they have to come up with brand new ideas that no one's ever seen before that's just gonna blow your mind. And I don't understand that mentality. For me, coming from a world of science, my original career was in uh, the biosciences, uh, you always build upon the work of other people. It's a collaborative effort that makes us grow as a people. So we can't possibly know what we know about genetics without you know hundreds of years of research and building upon that research over time. So for me, design is a lot like that. I lean on the shoulders of people who are better designers than me to take an idea and turn it into something that's more you know my style or my take on it. And I'm perfectly happy living that way as a woodworker. Um, if you give me a blank sheet of paper, I've kind of a hard time coming up with a brand new design that no one's seen before. But if you give me a starting point, I could then evolve that into something that I think personally is a little bit more interesting or a little bit better. And that's really what my goal is. I don't wanna reinvent the wheel, I just wanna make a better wheel, right? So thank you for watching. Thanks to John for letting me have fun with his design here. And I hope you guys found this uh, exploration into a new design and a new design evolution. Hope you found it interesting. Thanks for watching.